This is Jean Marie Ward for Buzzy Magazine. With me today is Cecilia Tan, award winning author, editor, and founder of Circlet Press, the first press devoted primarily to erotic science fiction and fantasy. Welcome, Cecilia. Welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Okay, I've been looking at your bio on Wikipedia, <laughs> and I think you started writing and getting published at eight. How did you get into this crazy well, business? So I always knew I wanted to be a writer. When I was like, you know, four and a half, maybe four years old, uh, you know, when you're little, you always draw on paper, and of course yeah. they, they tell you, oh, artists must sign their work, and so you have to write your name on, you know, and, and I would be drawing, I would say to my mom, Mom, how do you spell my name? Like, I knew the alphabet existed, and, mm -hmm. you know, so friends, she would say, oh, okay, and so I knew, had learned to form the letters of my name anyway, and then one day I was like, wait, there's a trick to it, because I've got a C repeated in my name. I'm like, oh, the letters match to the sounds. I t so basically, I, t I had this moment where I taught myself phonics, and I just, boom, took off. I would take the paper and fold it in half and write the title, and on the inside I would write, you know, words on one side, draw a picture on the other, and then write the end on the back. Mm -hmm. No one had taught me about spelling yet. So, you know, the end was spelled T H N D. Right? That Close was, it up, right? That's the way it goes, right? So so yeah, so my mother has lovingly preserved some of these these writing examples too of when I was four years old. So um so yeah, so I always considered myself a writer and my dad would say, Are you sure you don't wanna go to medical school? You know, and I No, Dad, really I don't wanna go to medical school, I'm a writer. Um, and he made a deal with me and he said, Okay, well, any money you make wh from writing while you live in my house I'll match it, um, which was an extremely validating thing yeah. for him to say. You know, that was his way of being supportive. So, um, so I started selling articles to teen magazines when I was still in high school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like someone had given me the uh, like the freelance writer's guide. You know, like mm -hmm. an old paperback copy of it, and I was like. Oh, so that's how you do it. So I would send a pitch letter and, you know, this, yeah. that, the other. And I, I started writing a monthly column for Super Teen, which was like 50 bucks a month. Went to my dad and was like, hey, Dad, you remember that deal? <laughs> when I was like 10, you know, so this is why I didn't have to have a, like a part-time job like all of my friends did, you know, mm -hmm. scooping ice cream or working as a bank teller or whatever after school. Because in the 1980s, you know, 100 bucks a month from, right, from that right there mm -hmm. was, you know. Um, Sizable. Uh, right. So... I didn't really get into writing fiction until after college, though, where it was the whole... I was writing it, but I wasn't publishing any of mm -hmm. it, and it was the whole, you know, you write your Tolkien rip-offs and your, you know, whatever, when you're a young writer and you're trying to figure out what you're going to write, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I was out of college and I wrote... This is one of those, you know, flash of inspiration kind of stories. I got the title first, Telepaths Don't Need Safe Words. Mm -hmm. And I said, ooh, let's write a BDSM erotic story about where the telepathic characters, so, you know, remember, wrote the whole thing down, sat there looking at it and was like, wow, I think that's the first time I've written a short story that was like, I felt was a whole story, mm -hmm. like that was a good story, that made sense, that was, you know, like I'd been through writing workshops in, in, both in, in college and in, you know, like summer programs and whatever, and had never felt like anything I wrote was like, never felt like good about something yeah. I had written. And I just, I just knew I was onto something. Of course, then it comes out, oh, there's actually nowhere you can publish this. Mm -hmm. You know, the BDSM magazines uh, are either exclusively lesbian or exclusively gay. The porn magazines won't take anything science fiction. The science fiction magazines, of course, wouldn't take anything that was explicitly sexual. <laughs> you know, it was like, mm -hmm. oh, no, no. 14-year-old <laughs> might read it or a 14-year-old's mother might get upset, you yeah. know, kind of a thing. I was like, okay. Uh, so I had to found Circlet Press just to publish this story <laughs> because there literally was nowhere. This is 1992, and there was nowhere to send it. So... Mm -hmm. That, and, and so that was really what launched my, my, my fiction writing career, is I had to self-publish this. And then immediately after that, began selling to magazines and, you know, all that kind of thing. But that was what broke the dam and mm -hmm. said, this is your subject, you know. Mixing science fiction and sexuality together is your thing. So Why? I, I mean, not to be rude, why, <laughs> what, did, what about that drove you to write that story? Well, I'll, t I'll tell you. So the thing is... Um, I grew up, uh, I'm bisexual, and I had basically at that point just discovered the BDSM community. I had always known I was kinky, and I had just always figured I'm going to have to somehow individually teach each lover kind of the kind of role playing that I like to do in the bedroom, and that would really turn me on. And so it's going to be, dating is going to be really difficult because mm -hmm. I'm going to have to really recruit carefully, you know, or what, I don't know. I, these are the ideas you have when you're growing up. You think you're the only one. I thought I was the only bisexual in the world. I thought I'm the only, you know, whatever. Of course, that turned out not to be true. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I just... You and David Bowie. Yeah, me and David Bowie. 
I swear. And, and everyone knows he's a space alien anyway. So. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. how it happened. This, this, this is where we're coming to the connection. The thing is, science fiction and fantasy, I felt, was the genre where there was room for me to exist. There was room for me to write myself into the story, where I could write people like myself and not necessarily as others, as you know, oh, I can write a whole society where BDSM is normal, like that's what they do. Or here's here's a culture where they're warlike and BDSM is actually sort of their religion and this is how they built their whole, they've structured their whole society on it. Over here, there's meanwhile, it's a different society who are just discovering it, you know, mm -hmm. and are and are, and are morally ambiguous about it, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of a thing. And, and what happens when, when these two cultures clash? Mm -hmm. Ta-da, I wrote a whole novel about it, you know, <laughs> that kind of a thing. So it's like science fiction was, you know, it, there's there's room for me there. I thought mm -hmm. there's room for me there. And then of course the erotic drive. <clears throat> I felt having grown up as a science fiction reader and a science you know lover of old Star Trek and whatnot, the felt thing I felt was missing from it was sexuality. I said where did that stuff go? You know so uh, you know where is that? That that's just like absent. Mm -hmm. So it felt to me like a perfect fit because I was sort of filling in both roles, mm -hmm. you know, so, and it was one of these, like, chocolate and peanut butter questions, too, where, where people were like, you can't put sexuality in science fiction, and I'm like, why not, and once I had put the chocolate and the peanut butter together, people were like, oh, that, that makes total sense. That tastes <laughs> good, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, gee, oh, we really like that, you know, so, <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. What has been the biggest change in the 20, 21 years since <laughs> you founded Circlet Press? Mm -hmm. In the publishing landscape. So the two two big changes, two huge changes, and I think they're related. One is that we have digital books now, and that allows people to buy their erotic books without having to walk up to the clerk in a bookstore and like hide it under a magazine, you know, kind of a thing. That um, first of all, we have I think also many younger readers who are not at all uh, not at all afraid to just walk up to the clerk with their whatever yeah. their smutty book is, you know, um, th th they're not ashamed. They're also not ashamed to buy science fiction. I mean, mm -hmm. there are people who didn't want to be seen with science fiction covers. See, seen with science fiction or romance novels or, you know, whatever. People feel judged for what they read. And, you know, I think the younger generation feels less judged about it. Um, and you can't tell the book on your Kindle anyway. Right. But when you buy a digital book, yeah, nobody can tell what you're reading. You know, you could be reading the New York Times. You could be reading, you know, the latest number one New York Times bestseller, which brings me to the subject okay. of Fifty Shades of Grey. Mm -hmm. The other big change is that um, all of a sudden, the number one selling book in the English language is this supposedly extremely kinky BDSM book, um, which has suddenly opened the conversation. Like people are allowed to talk about the fact that oh, people people like kinky books and that kinky books exist, <laughs> you know, and so forth. And the funny thing is, Fifty Shades is actually fairly vanilla by my standards, <laughs> you know. So um, it's. I think pe many people buy it thinking they're going to get a really, really kinky book because that's its reputation. And then they get sort of disappointed as they go on and on in the book and it gets less and less kinky as it goes along, you mm -hmm. know. And, um, you know, may hopefully they get wrapped up in the romance and, you know, the characters and whatever. Yeah. But as far as, you know, sort of real sort of kink per page, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it's like it, it, it trails off. So, um, of course, what am I doing now? I'm writing a three-book BDSM billionaire trilogy for a major publishing house because they are like, you know, we think you can do it better. <laughs> <laughs> They're pro they may be right. We'll right. see. So. We'll see. Is that what you're working on now? That is the big thing I'm working on now. The, the first book is out, an e-book right now. It's called Slow Surrender. Mm -hmm. You have to say it right. Slow no. Surrender. Right. So, so here's where David Bowie comes back into the story. So I'm writing this, the trilogy genre is called BDSM Billionaire is what they're calling it. That's what Fifty Shades of Grey was. It has to be a trilogy, mm -hmm. just like when Tolkien came out. It's like now every high fantasy book has to have a trilogy. Every r BDSM Billionaire romance has to be a trilogy. So I'm writing this series for Hachette. Um, the first book is out in ebook right now called Slow Surrender, and the paperback comes out in August. And then the second book is going to be called Slow Seduction, and it'll be out in January. And ebook and mm -hmm. paperback are going to come out simultaneously. You know, so they're, they're pushing them out pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, so Slow Surrender, it, it had to be set in the real world, though. They want, they don't want space aliens and vampires and, you know, whatnot in this genre. That's paranormal or, you know, whatever. So it's like, okay, I have to put it in the real world. I couldn't just set it in the real world. <laughs> after all, you know, after all the time writing science fiction and fantasy. So my main character, in my mind, is based on David Bowie. <laughs> ah. The, the male hero is this, uh, you know, tall 
somewhat British, you know, whatever sort of. Many of my fans are, are actually putting Benedict Cumberbatch apparently into this role. Yes. Which it, it, if, if we, there was ever a movie version, I would not say no to him. Uh -huh. this role. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, but in my mind, it, it, he's he's sort of a young David Bowie. He's the David Bowie from The Hunger, mm -hmm. which was yes. a big vampire movie. I remember The Hunger. <laughs> right. I remember The Hunger. Yes, yes, exactly. And so uh, you know, and I needed somebody who I could keep up the hots for for three whole books yes. <laughs> as well. So, so yeah, so I said, let's go straight to the top. Let's go to number one. Um, and so, you know, and he's uh, he's secretly a rock star, you know, in the book. She doesn't, the, our main char our hero heroine does not know this at first, but mm -hmm. and probably everyone who reads the blurb on the back of the book will have guessed it by the time, you know, that first Unfortunately, the heroines never get the blurb on the right, back of the book. I know, they don't. They have, to, they have to find it all out for themselves. But, yeah, so, um, so... And my point was I wanted to write a BDSM story in which, unlike in Fifty Shades, as the two characters fall more and more in love, the BDSM gets more intense, not less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't do it because they're they're damaged or they're you know there's something wrong with them, and this is why they need it. It's you know it's something. It's part of how they bond. It's a huge part of how they they learn to interact with one another and how they they discover the boundaries between their two. You know, I mean, the whole thing, the romance is you've got two people and you're tr making them one thing. You know, that's the sort of the, the mythology of the true love, right? But then it's all about the negotiation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, well, in yeah. this case, it's BDSM, so the negotiation is really explicit, <laughs> you know, yeah. where they actually sit down and talk about where do I end and you begin? Where do my desires end and your submissions start? You know, mm -hmm. that kind of yeah. thing. So, yeah, so I'm having great fun writing it. It's it's really, really cool. But, um, yeah, and, and hopefully people will like it. And, you know. and where does baseball fit in all this? <laughs> So baseball is just like a yet another thing I do. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? So as my partner Corwin puts it, I have this uncanny ability to take anything that I am a fan of and turn it into my job. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in the same way that I started writing, you know, for the teen magazines when I was a teenager, in the, I grew up loving the New York Yankees, grew up in the, as a Yankees fan. My whole family are Yankees fans. It's like the family religion, basically. Mm -hmm. We don't have Christmas. We have Yankee Christmas. No. Where we get together during spring training, and, you know, I, I, I made little pinstripe stockings for it and everything. Um, that, I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're like, oh, we're not going to see each other in December. How will we have Yankee Christmas? You know, so, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's um, yeah, so, and then, you know, I started started writing baseball articles at some point in the, at the end of the 90s and in the 2000s, you know, got published that way also, and the next thing you know, I, I this past winter, I edited the baseball prospectus. So, you know, it's, Whoa. yeah, and I, I edit the baseball research journal for the Society for American Baseball Research and, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, so all of a sudden, it's, you know, an over, overnight, yeah, over the course of 10 years, I've gone from just being a baseball fan to... It's another part of my job. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's a very cool part of your job. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, yes. and we put baseball metaphors <laughs> in everything. Right, right. Well, and baseball, you know, there's so many sex and baseball metaphors that I did, in fact, at one point, eventually have to write a baseball romance novel. Oh. It's, it's still available. It's called The Hot Streak, and uh, it's it's an ebook uh, from mm -hmm. Ravenous Romance. But yes, it's a it's a heterosexual baseball love story, you know, in in which I I think some. People are like, I think there's too much baseball in it. I'm like, there's no, there's too much baseball. So yeah, so it's it's a it's a romance for all my, you know, baseball loving female fans. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, we're just about out of time. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, not really. Go out, read, have fun. That's what life is all about. Great. Thank you, Cecilia, and thank you for Buzzy Magazine.